Okay, here I am. I've tried, I, I recorded this first part of the review multiple times on the software that I have for the camera that I was given by the department. But for some reason that software just kept shutting down on me and shutting down on me and shutting down on me. So after like the fifth time and lots of frustration, I decided to try another way, which was to use um, a capability inside Canvas um, called Zoom. So remember um, in the orientation, I mentioned you can schedule Zoom sessions with me. Um, and so I'm attempting to record this video as a Zoom video to see if it'll finally go through and save. Um, so the first problem we had was to determine whether the function graph is one-to-one. -one. And to do that, we did the horizontal line test, but notice that when we drew one horizontal line here, the graph hit the line more than one time. So you would select, no, there is a horizontal line that intersects the graph at more than one point. Um, now in the, re the exam, I noticed that they do ask you some one-to-one -one problems, but they don't give you the graph. Instead, they give you the functions. And so you have to remember how to do those because you're gonna need to show your work. And you cannot just type them in your calculator, put the graph on your paper, and then do the horizontal line test. Um, unless you graph them by hand, meaning you've made a table of X values, calculated all the Y values, graphed all the points, connected all the dots, and then did the horizontal line test. That would be okay. But the other way that we did it in the section itself was we plugged in A into the function, we plugged in B into the function, and then we took that equation and we solved for A. And if we got A equal to B, then yes, they were one-to-one. -one. If we got A and we didn't, if we solved for A and we didn't get B, then no, they were not one-to-one. -one. So for this function here, I plugged in A and then I plugged in B. And in order to solve for A, I had to add one to both sides. And then once I did that, I had to divide by the coefficient two. And coincidentally, we ended up with B on the other side. So that function is one to one. Similarly, I did it on another function here, three X minus two cubed. So I plugged in A and then I plugged in B. And then to solve this for A, I had to first get rid of the coefficient. So then I had A minus two cubed equal to B minus two cubed. So I took the cube root on both sides, I ended up with a minus two and b minus two. And then to solve for a, I had to add two on both sides. And coincidentally, I got a equal to b again. So this one was one to one. So I just wanted you to have an example of that. Now, if you need to um, pause the video so you can copy all of this down because this was not included in the original blank packet. This was something that I added in after reviewing the test itself. Okay. So um, I'm going to continue on over here. Now, if I have a function that's an exponential and they ask me to evaluate that function at a particular value, all you're doing is plugging in this number for x. And so that x right there would become negative three. And if you type this in your calculator just the way it is, um, you do end up with 729. So again, I was computing stuff for quite a while. So I'm gonna have to go way back. There we go. If you type in one ninth raised to the power of three, negative three, you get 729. So that's where this came from. Now, for number three, when we solved an equation like this, what we what I did was once I know the exponential base is 36, I use log base 36 on both sides of the equation. So log base 36 of the left side and then log base 36 of the right side, okay? Now here the base and the base matches. This base belongs to the log. So when these two bases cancel, the log cancels as well. So all I'm left with is x equal to this expression. Now that expression can be typed in the calculator. We just have to use the change of base formula. So I have to do log of the argument or ln of the argument over ln of the old base. And when I typed this in the calculator, I did end up getting one half. 
And then the problem in my math lab said to type in an integer or a simplified fraction, so I typed in my simplified fraction. Now number four is very similar. The only difference is that my base is a fraction. That really doesn't affect anything. I still do the problem the same way. So I'm gonna do log base five halves on both sides. And then here, this five halves base and that five halves base along with the log cancel each other out and I just have X. On this side, it's just an expression which can be typed in my calculator. So I'm gonna have log of the argument over, or ln of the argument over ln of the base. And when I typed that in the calculator, I ended up with negative three. Um, so here it says, write your answer, type in an integer or a fraction. I typed in the integer negative three. Um, number five, here when you have an exponent raised to another exponent, you just multiply them. So I get e to the eight x. And I notice that this is an exponential base e. So to get rid of the exponential base e, you have to use a log base e, which is the same as ln. So I took ln on both sides, and then this log base e and the exponential base e cancel each other out, leaving me with just the exponent. And the same thing happens on this side. Log base e and exponen exponential base e cancel each other out, and I'm left with 8x. So I minus 10x on both sides. I was left with negative 1 equal to negative 2x divided by negative 2 on both sides and ended up with x equal to 1 half. We didn't get multiple answers, so we just typed in 1 half all on its own. Now, I did have an extra problem that I wanted to cover um, because that problem that we just covered, yes, there were exponentials on both sides of the equation, but the bases were the same on that equation. And I noticed that on the test, we had some problems in there where the bases were not the same. And so I needed to address how to solve that kind of problem. Although we've done it in the uh, lecture videos for the sections, I just kind of wanted to retouch it um, and solve it using um, the methods that we've learned so far. So at the very beginning, when you first learn about logs, I believe is in 4.3, um, what they tell you to do is, or when you learn about exponentials in 4.2, they tell you to um, get them to where they have the same base, okay? And since you can't write eight equal to four to some base, because four to the first power is four and four to the second power is 16, it skips right over eight. So since you can't do this, you have to go with the smaller base, like two. And I can write four as two squared, and I can write eight as two cubed. But when you have an exponent raised to an exponent, you multiply those. And when you have an exponent raised to an exponent, I do have to distribute that, but I get this exponent. Then in order for two exponentials to equivalent to each other, their exponents should be equivalent to each other. So then I have this expression, this equation, and if I minus x on both sides, I get negative five x equals negative three. And if I divide by negative five on both sides, I get three fifths. Now you can solve it the other way we've been solving problems, which is to use the logs, right? So I just looked at this side and I noticed that I had base four. I could have done the same thing with base eight, but I just chose to do it base four. I'm not gonna do it a third way. So I did log base four on this side, log base four on that side. Now on this side, it cancels out the exponential, so I just have two x. On this side, it does not cancel out the exponential because this base and this base do not match. So the only thing else I could do was use my properties that says when you have an exponent on your argument inside of a log, that exponent can be written in the front. And then this, I could type in my calculator as ln of eight over ln of four. And coincidentally, when I did that, it came out to a nice number, which was three halves. So I went ahead and I distributed that three halves and I got nine halves X minus three halves. Then I noticed that I had fractions. So I multiplied each term by two to get rid of that fraction. And I ended up with four X equals to nine X minus three. Notice that's the exact same equation that we had here on this side. And so then I minus the nine X divided by the negative five and I still got the um, positive three fifths. So again, if you need to pause the video while that was happening, go back and do that so you can copy that problem down. 
Um, I am going to continue to the next two examples and then I'll stop the video because it looks like I actually might be able to successfully record this one using the Zoom. Um, was not having any luck using the program I have been using um, these last two weeks. So, um, when it comes to interest problems, you definitely want to have this information on your note sheet. So you need to have the formula for compounded interest, and then you need to have the formula for continual compounded interest. Now, when you have this formula, there's different values of n. n equals one for annually, n equals two for semi-annually, four for quarterly, 12 for monthly, 52 for weekly, and then 360 for daily. Make sure you have all of those written down because you really don't know which one of those you're gonna get on the test. So you don't wanna say, oh, this is semi-annually, so I'm gonna have semi-annually on the test. No, that may not be the case, okay? So make sure you do have all the end values for all different compounding sequences, okay? And then, um, depending on what the problem tells you, you'll know which end value to use. Now for this problem, number six, it tells me find the future value and interest earned if $8,706.54 is invested for nine years at 4% compounded A semi-annually and B continuously. So I will have to use both of these formulas. I have to use this formula with n equal to 2 for semi-annually, and then I'll have to use this formula for continuously. So future value does mean they want the amount afterward, which is the capital A. Um, the investment amount is the P, that's here, and the time T is in years, and then this rate can actually, I need to use a decimal, which is 0.04. So I plugged everybody into this formula, P being this number, one, and then my rates over my N, and then my years times my N. And when I did that in the calculator, what did I get? I typed that all in there, and I got this number here. We do need to round it to the nearest hundredth because it is money. The three is not going to affect the eight. So you get $12,435.08. So that's the future value. Now, in order for us to find the interest, all we have to do is subtract what we originally started with. And when I did that in the calculator, um, I got 3,728.54. Now for the next part, we had to use the continuous formula. So I plugged in the P, plugged in the R, plugged in the T, and then let's see what I got there. So that's where I plugged everything in and I got this value, but that nine does change that to 34 cents. And then if I subtract my original amount, I will get the interest amount. And so that is there. Now, um, the next problem says, bank A is lending money at this rate, which is this in a decimal, compounded quarterly, which means four, Bank B is at this rate, compounded annually, which means N equals one. And then bank C is at this rate, which is this decimal, compounded monthly, which is this. Now notice, even though this one is the lowest rate, it's compounded the most. So you really can't tell which one is the, the highest or the lowest just now. And this one that has compounded, the rate is the highest, the number of times that it's compounded is the lowest. So that's not necessarily gonna tell us um, anything. So the question is, which bank will pay the least interest? So whichever one gives me the smaller final amount, as long as I use the same investment value and the same number of years for all three cases, then the one that gives me the least um, final amount is going to be the one that earned the least amount of interest. So essentially you could put whatever P value and whatever T value you want. You just have to make sure you use the same P value for all three banks and the same time for all three banks, okay? I chose to use P equal to 1000 and T equal to one. Um, normally those are the ones that the book will use all the time. So I just decided to stay consistent with that. 
So I used 1001 plus the first guy's rate over the quarterly and I typed it into the calculator and I got this value here. That six does make that 12 go up. So I got 167.13. For bank B, I typed in their rate, right? And compounded only once per year. And so then I ended up with just 1066 flat. You could put 0, 0 if you really want to. And then for bank C, I used that guy's rate and that quarterly, or I'm sorry, um, monthly value of 12. And the one does not affect the seven, so I got 1066.97. Now, which one is the least? This is the least, so that is why I selected bank B, okay? I'm going to stop the recording here and then I'll resume in another video the next few problems over logs.